Welcome to the Business of Writing, where we talk about all things business and writing related. I'm your host, Joe Solari. I help authors build great businesses. And today's guest is Pierre Jante. How are you doing, Pierre? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me, Joe. Uh, this is going to be interesting, folks that are watching or listening, because uh, Pierre is kind of a unicorn. <laughs> he is uh, doing some things that you don't hear a lot of people doing successfully, and that is he's a poet, a poet writing nonfiction self-help, and has built an amazing direct platform with his community. So we're going to go through all that stuff and understand from the master here how we might be able to apply some of that stuff to your business. So why don't you start out just like in the beginning, like what got you writing and taking on this particular task of trying to sell poetry direct? In writing, so the beginning is, I, is pretty much starting in college. I always, for some reason, I started being fascinated by writing and wanting to take a lot of course, because I'm originally from Haiti and English. I spent, since I was 11, up until the time I went, went to college, it was all focusing on learning the, the language. And, and just for some odd reason, I was just fascinated by social media, spent a lot of time on MySpace. <laughs> um, MySpace at that time, there was Planet, and there was another website too. I spent a lot of my studying time on there and a lot of the, you know, courses I took, you know, classes that I took at Bowdoin College in Maine was um, revolved around writing and everything. And little did I know, I did drop out of college and that did not work out. And little did I know that would be the, the foundation I need to be where I'm at because over the years I work at a propane company and I started exploring with Twitter a lot and I would post these little lines, whether it's in some sort of inspiration or whatever it was, and it started growing because on Twitter, we used to, I used to trend just playing around on um, just doing different things, a lot of jokes going on. <laughs> but then I, tr I went to just writing motivational content and I started a brand named Gentleman. And the whole focus of that was to, to help. It was all about giving men a voice, their emotion, mm -hmm. their place in relationship and so forth. And from there, I launched a blog, gentlemanhood.com, and we started really putting a lot of content just for relationship and, and just personal advice. And then I, when Instagram rolled out, which was a perfect time for me because now I started writing content where I could attach a name to it. And that gave me the encouragement. And also we had to the, the, the supporters, the, the readers, the followers would always say, hey, we need a book, we need a book. And that led to me launching my first book, which is the title was Unspoken Feelings of a, is Unspoken Feelings of a Gentleman. And, and then from there, the, con the content was doing well. The book landed, was ranking well on Amazon. During that time, I had just joined Create Space. I started actually doing everything myself on WooCommerce. And, and then from there, it, I kind of gravitated to where I wrote a poetry book for women because at these events or the book tour that I had for this, a lot of people, women really enjoyed the content because they were like, look, you're, you're speaking about men and how they need to be emotionally available, open and so forth. And this is way being now I see that type of content around a lot. But this is like in 2014, it was just like social media content. We weren't necessarily pushing that. It was a lot of content for women. A lot of them ask her, why don't you write something for women during these book tours? Stop. So I. I went to writing a poetry book title to the women I once loved. It was more of something like, I've never been a woman, but here's what I learn from dating different women and so forth. And it, it was written in a poetic form. And that took off in mid early 2016. Okay. I decided I wanted to have a dedicated poetry page, which which is the one you see now, Pierre Gentil. And I started that from scratch in 2016, 2017. I launched my book, uh, my book, Her. Actually, a month before that, I released Unspoken Feelings of a Gentleman 2, but it was on a different page, which was my gentlemanhood account. So now this new page, 2017, I launched my poetry book, Her. And the rest is history. But 
a lot of it was me just fascinated with the English language, pushing myself to learn it a little bit more and loving playing around with words and just inspiring people above all. And when you when you were thinking through this, what made you decide to start selling the books? And, and also, where where was the first place you were selling the books? Was it what, did you start out direct right away, or was it yeah. Amazon or? So while I'm creating this book that I'm I'm working on for authors, I realized that I started with the direct sales model, which was which is why it was easier for me to come back to it because my first book when I launched it, I, I live in Fort Myers area, which is Southwest Florida. I could not find a printer to print it because I I wasn't familiar with Amazon then. I just knew. Someone back in 2010, an author named Tony Gaskin had mentioned Create Space to me, but I was unfamiliar with that. Mm -hmm. What I did is while I was printing t-shirts for the brand that I had, which is Gentleman Hood, I started looking around to see what's the nearest printer. And I found a printer in Miami, Florida. It's, I mean, Doral, but Miami area. And I printed my first hundred books through them. And on my Instagram, I posted about you know, just letting people know I'm going to launch this book and so forth. And a lot of people started pre-ordering. Well, then I used MailChimp to gather emails because I had a MailChimp since like 2009 as well. And and I launched it and we sold the first night, we sold 150 copies. And within that month, we sold 500. I, I'd have to keep printing, getting the printers to ship it. It came to a point where one time in my <laughs> career it's crazy we still use the printer because of the relationship from time to time i would drive i that one month i drove three thousand miles just back and forth from my from my house to the printer just to get books because we will run out of books and keep driving so it's like two hour <laughs> drive from it i'm like oh my god i'm driving a lot but the direct sales model sometimes it, it it always has been part of my foundation. It's always been like a savior to me. And it was interesting that I, I finally dove right back into it 2019. And now the success has been ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you walk us through that? Like this move from you kind of fall into this working out and uh, it's successful and now you're direct printing. And when did you start hearing about things like KDP and getting on Apple and Barnes and Noble and all that fun stuff. Hmm. So in 2000, I believe 16 or 15, whenever I was on tour, I toured in Cali and I have one of my, my manager actually has a buddy who's, who's, who used to play in the NBA and, and now he's a TV announcer and so forth well, for the games. And he mentioned, why are you doing so much leg work if there's other places like create space that you could have the book distributed through. And I wasn't, during that time, it was a burden to get the books printed and travel with them. And and also I started running out of cash when it comes to maintaining this because a direct sale model, that's one thing that could drain you and people don't realize. Um, so after touring, I went back home and was like, let me explore create space. And mm -hmm. In 2015 or probably late 14, I think, no, 15, I uploaded my books on KDP and then I started researching for everywhere else that I could put the book. So I found out how to put it on Apple iBooks. I found out how to put it on KDP that time was separate from physical copies because it was mm -hmm. CreateSpace and it was KDP. And then I put it on every platform that I could. And believe it or not, I did not, no, my book was on Apple or remembered that I did it until KDP once sent me a message of saying you do not have oh no I signed up for I signed up for Kindle Unlimited mm. and and it was the first if I think it was brand new during that time and I it sent me a message and said you're not qualified because we noticed that your book is on another platform. And I went like, what platform is it on? <laughs> and come to find out, we check our Apple iBooks and that's where I noticed I was selling quite a bit. So now I made myself familiar with all those platforms um, platforms, and started having it on all of them. Then in 2017, when my book Her, which is the bestseller that I have, it started grabbing, getting a lot of traction. I started having conversation with, with some, of, some of my peers and one of them mentioned Ingram to me because mm -hmm. I needed to get into bookstores 
and I, w I started having a marketing plan while I was sending people to bookstores and having them request. And, and I jumped into Anchor and became one of the top seller quick, which made it easier. Now you had a sales rep, you had communication in there, and I jumped through all the hurdles. And I even have a good relationship with my sales rep now, and she's no longer at Ingram. So that tells you how that one. But everything else just started falling into into together. It's just a matter of expanding and, and then to diving into this model. I don't know if you want me to, to, to go in. To yes, this. I think uh, it's kind of natural for you to go into like how you're going to market right now. Yes. Mid-2018, this book, my book, Her, is a bestseller. It's also the second volume is doing well. Maybe it was a reach Barnes & Noble top sellers list and was on the end caps. It was everything was happening all by itself. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I have to say, so while I was writing, I, I realized this happened too. During the Trump's presidency, he mentioned something about, made the comment about Haitians, which we were too fair of, but that time it pushed a lot of bookstores to push Haitian authors to the front. And I ended up being one of those who were somehow made it, they were, talking about me that gave me a, a huge boost so since the book started circulating everywhere target came knocking on my door and with target coming knocking on my door the deal worked out perfect i wanted i was getting i was launching the third part of the series so it's her her volume two and him so i was launching him during that time and when target came came knocking out you know on my door they wanted all three of them together. It first started with her, then it was like, okay, her too is on the end cap and it's on different tables at Barnes and Noble. So we want this and we also want him. So we made out, the deal went well. I can't really name the distributor that really negotiated this deal because yeah. come to find out the first one, the first print run did not work as well. There were some errors in the book and so forth which I'm going with somewhere with this by mentioning that. So with that not going well, it ended up where they wanted more books, but it seems like something was stopping it. It all ended up to being where the books landed in, in Target. I was one of the top number two seller there, selling about 600 books, 600 copies a week there. And, and yeah, they actually cut the contract. They cut the contract to where out of the, I think, 50,000 books that were printed, 15,000 of them were, ret were returned, mm -hmm. and and I had to do something. You're talking about this is mid-2019, I have a daughter coming, coming into the world, it's my birthday, and I said, look, I have to figure out what to do. And I did not want to use WooCommerce, which I had before, I decided to create a brand new shop that I could do myself, and this is how I landed on, on Shopify. Um, now, the great thing about landing on Shopify was I was already, for, for years, I've done Facebook ads. As we were speaking earlier, I mentioned it was our editor. We're, you know, boosting posts where those engagements were doing well. So I've been doing ads since 2015. So this was easy to get into because prior to that, that time before the return, I was selling my eBooks to people internationally because I was doing good in the US and I was in different bookstores like the Philippines and Indonesia. I'm a bestseller there. However, there's other countries that couldn't get my book and I felt like the audience in those countries, I could deliver eBooks to them. So I started using SAM cards to sell that way and it was great because now I was not using ads the way author, I mean authors typically use it, which is to run, engage, boost your posts or run link clicks to Amazon. So right into that of me having that data collection and way of running as like a typical business outside the, the book industry, I started doing the same thing with my Shopify. And what I did is I told, I mentioned to the distributor, look, I need, um, you could ship out my books to me. I found a storage unit near my house and 20K books, 20 to 50K book and Facebook group, you actually would see in the early 2019, I showed the entire room where I built shelves and, and, and just simply set everything up my, and it was one of the best decisions I've made because 2019 roll out, we scaled to seven figure within that from August to December. And then from there, COVID hit and 
everything changed because now I was growing so fast and now we have a warehouse. This is a, my office is a room in the warehouse. There's you know, more space. We have a warehouse and we were increasing in team. And I literally placed a direct sale model to where now I, everything worked out so perfectly that we, we ended up from the experience before to now we ended up building all the relationship we need to where we're, print, we're, we're making print run through Ingram or different um, printers where we have pallets of books come in and they're being sold and we're able to control it. We're able to control the data and make a lot better, more better decisions. Because one of the things with this model is that I appreciate about it is the fact that now I feel like I wasn't relying on anyone. Mm -hmm. where Target couldn't tell me, all right, we're going to return books. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to sell it. Barnes & Noble couldn't necessarily, before I would have to submit um, my books and try to get in and it would be the same run around. But it's like I published a book during 2019 when I started this model. I had the sales rep for the region actually contact me about getting the book in there versus before, I would try to find him and how to get a hold of him to put the book in the bookstore. So it gave me a lot more power over my business and more control. And it's the first time we started feeling more like a business where within the last two and a half years or two years that we've been, we've had a cash flow. We're not, we're not waiting on Amazon 60 day or 90 day with distributors just operating um, within that. But if Target had not made that mistake, and, and granted, I cannot put it on Target because I found out the distributor could not handle the, the, the distribution, I guess. They weren't printing them fast enough. They, weren't, they couldn't make the deal. Target was demand, were demanding for more books, more mm. inventory, and they couldn't do it simply because at that time as an author, I did not have this type of credit line. It was a, you're talking about ordering a hundred thousand books and I, I can't necessarily handle the, the payment, the cost for that. So they were managing risk on their end and which again, it ended up being a blessing because now I think I'm in a position where if we negotiate with Target, I will cut out any middleman. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, it's funny how those things play out. You think at first it's a tragedy, but it actually gets you into a better spot. Yeah. So, can can you give us a feel for like what part of your business is physical books, like what percentage of sales, and then also what percentages are direct versus being sold on Amazon or iBooks? Just you don't have to get into numbers, but just kind of percentages to give people a feel. Yeah, about 98% of our sales, to be honest, are physical copies. Because I write poetry oftentimes, even people get ebooks, they're like, we don't, we want the real book. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Then, in terms of, I'm thinking, in terms of, of Amazon, I think about 30% come from Amazon and let's say like a one or 2% from iBooks and those other platforms. But Amazon, is the main source because well not the main source i'm saying in terms of other platforms involved because amazon find a way to cut through everything because when people see the ad on facebook or want the book the first thing they ask themselves is is it on amazon and and also those numbers aren't necessarily fair per se because for for a year almost a year or however long there was a shutdown no one was going into bookstores it was either Amazon or get it directly from me. So Amazon's a little bit biased here, but this year we're seeing a decrease on Amazon because I've I've already started implementing a system where when people order from Amazon, it's going through through our Amazon Central account, Seller Central account, and where I want credit for all of them because one of the things that I'm big on is seeing how the landscape is changing and marketing itself that i want control of all the data that we can and even even this year if we were to, we were talking about decreasing on ad spend earlier one of the reasons that i did not decrease in terms of my ad spend even though the platform has had some difficulties is because of the fact i want to keep collecting data my email list is a priority my my text list is a priority because with that data, we can retarget them on any platform. We could always speak to them. So that's why this model is attractive to me because not only did the retailers, the distributor mess me over, the retail store technically messed me over. 
Amazon and all the other platforms never gave me the res what I needed to, to have a, a, a long-standing business. And what I mean by that is in 2019, early that year, earlier that year too, or was it 2018, I had a book tour um, for my new book, Him, and I realized as I was marketing it, no, there was only a small amount of people showing to these book, book stops. And it was less than before when I had only about 50,000 followers, and now I had 500,000 followers and less people were showing to, to the book tour stop. And not only that, I used to sell tickets and have it at, a, at my own um, ven a venue of choice. Well, now I was having it in Barnes and Noble and we were still having trouble seeing, hmm. uh, having people there. So I realized that the engagement, which I knew, but I didn't see the capacity affected me. It was, the engagement on those platforms was decreasing especially on Facebook, on every platform as you're growing, there's people who are no longer using those or are active or may not pay attention to you. But I know for a fact Facebook is, you know, suppressing the audience, allowing only a small percentage of them to see because the, go the goal is for you to pay to see. It. It's a pay-to-play yeah, yeah. platform. So everyone who showed up to my book tour stop would say, oh, we just saw this. I didn't even know you were having it. And I'm like... How? I've been marketing this for months. So we came to where, okay, we needed to have a little bit more control with this. So we started doing the email, giving freebie and so forth for lead magnets. But that was not effective for me because although I changed my, my mindset to where I only marketed to, to my existing audience because I have 1.8 million followers on, on uh, Facebook and 700 now on Instagram, where we can't, we're kind of back to that where we're running this free ebook to people who know who I am so we could capture them. Mm -hmm. But during that time, it was not yielding results fast enough. So within this model, what ended up happening is that when they make a purchase, they automatically fall into our email funnel and, and we'll go from there. But short and I mean, short answer, I mean, to shorten up the answer <laughs> is Amazon definitely cover about 30% of our sales. And it's actually, when you're in this model, you realize that like, it's not the thing that you, you, you kind of look at the numbers different because before when you're selling on Amazon, it's like, okay, royalty, yeah. Versus now you're kind of like, if I would have sold it on my website, there would have been a lot more profit. My profit <laughs> margin would have been better. So now it's like, we're not necessarily happy to say that Amazon has 30% of it, especially now we know how to mask that where people do, who are fans of Amazon, see that they're not just ordering on Amazon. Um, I mean, they're still ordering on Amazon, but they don't know where fulfilling it. But Amazon 30%, iBooks and all these other platforms, I'll say about a two, two to five percent. And our distributor did a lot to last year where he came around about a good 10% last year, but now we're controlling everything. Well, and to put this into context for the audience, that 30% that on, on Amazon is a significant amount of sales, right? Like you know, that, that book is, I have, haven't looked at it recently, but you've got quite a, what, how many thousand reviews and? 20,000. Yeah, 20,000 reviews, right? <laughs> and it's all it's also the situation where most folks are selling an electronic product. So you're you're also very unique in that situation that you you you've you're dealing with the physical product still, which has got some sh a lot of shortcomings. I mean, you have to storm somewhere. You've got to... It's a it's and and that's one thing. So if while you're mentioning that, one of the things that if the audience who someone who may be interested in even this model one of the one of the things i was afraid about was just the the expense that would it will that will come with trying to handle something like this and and it does have its shortcoming it does have the tough part what i wish i would have done different is i had already a distributor in california that handles all my books and so forth in terms of international so they have a huge warehouse they, they have all everything already in place for a fulfillment center. And 
because I was so focused on collecting all the data myself, I did not consider them. And that ended up being the part where I wish I would have changed different. Although I do have an office here, I love it. I could have stayed at my old office, which we were now own, and have less risk because they have their insurance, they have their team for fulfillment and so forth. It comes off a shortcoming, but a, a lot of it too, it, it, it puts you in a position, in a better position to be more personal with your audience, your own customer services handling. Sometimes they hear from me. It's just the, the being out of touch with when it comes to Amazon, it's, it's something that, or any other platform is something that I, I, I just dislike. For folks, for a lot of folks you know, that are 20 books folks, or just, just most tr authors that are selling, like you're, you're kind of sounding crazy because that's their world, right? Like they don't, they can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads, but they're sending all those people to Amazon. So they, they never see anything beyond this link that drives them to Amazon. So I would not to rub it in more, but just kind of talk about with this model, how much more you see, like that you get to see, not only can you see the whole transaction, but you can help Facebook to find more customers because you can share that transaction data onto your website, what, what pages they go to, if they abandon the cart, all that crazy stuff that the usual, most authors just can't do because they use Amazon as their main sales platform. Yeah. And that was a part that I could not, you know, as someone who's who's been a marketer since 2015, that was a part I could not keep going, the other direction I could not keep going into because one of the things is Facebook is just an amazing tool. They could give you so much data, so many data points that can help your business. And the idea that I would blindly spend during the early days, spend $10,000 marketing a month, and simply wait 60 to 90 days for it to come. I have no <laughs> real idea of what's going on in the back end started bothering me because they'll call, yes, I have this amount of clicks, but what did they do? And for a while when we're operating the way most people within that, that world operate in the book industry, I, I use a, a link to determine, it was a genius link, and determine all the details about what, what country, and so forth. But one of the things I did is send them directly to my author's page just to see how they react there. And we noticed like more people would buy the book, I mean the bundle, the books in terms of bundles. And then it came to where like, okay, what more are we missing? And that's why I love the Shopify model because we can see everything. So once they come into the store, the, the Shopify um, store, it doesn't necessarily say who, but you can watch how the person interact on the website. Let's just mm -hmm. tell you that. So you can see, you know, how long they spend on the product page and so forth. But then you get to see like, hey, if they buy this and we put this in front of them, what happened? Oftentimes, as long as we put a bundle option, they're always bundled. They always take the upsell. Even when I'm promoting a new book, I just got one of my, the books that's, that I have traditional, traditionally published that I, I bought some inventory and have it listed on the website. And while I sent out an email for people to purchase, no one will, everyone was buying just the book itself. But then I'm like, we need an upsell option for it. And we just simply attach a book to it. And from there, the book just 50% of the people started taking that book. Mm. So we understand, we see the behavior there. Then it comes to after you go from an upsell, this cross sell where I sell other things to them and something that we couldn't do on Amazon. I started with selling t-shirts before I got into the book, book business. And now I was back to like the t-shirts we have, let's sell them. Let's find a way to create more and so forth. So we have that. Then even after they check out, we can see what's going on and we sell them. I said one of my, my latest book, I've never marketed really to my audience. I mainly sell it as a post-purchase sale. So after they go through the whole phase of checkout. So not only that, you get on Facebook will tell you, hey, this amount of people left this into the cart. You can use ads to retarget them. Then based on the amount of people who purchase, Facebook has an idea of, we have so many data points to, to say, okay, the average person spent this much. We could find people within that range or people that are more like it was like a one push button thing like like we were yeah. talking about earlier where you could 
easily let that flow and then you get into emails where if they start the transaction they don't they don't do anything you could say hey you have it you have this into your cart you should check out here's a 10 percent discount it in every aspect and and i'm writing my, a book about it right now as in every yeah, aspect yeah. we notice there's a funnel and within that funnel, you get to speak to them and retarget them. And the way I mentioned in the book is really becoming your own Amazon. Because when you look at Amazon, they do all of these things. You just don't have the capability <laughs> to control it, yeah. but they do. You look at a book, once you get back on the site, it's there. We have the same ability to make sure we put you back in front of the same book. When you leave it in the cart, you can guarantee you're gonna see it in email. There's that. When there's a new book out, you could market to the same people who bought the previous one. You can do that with the Facebook ads, with the Shopify emails. There's, it's being able to be like the biggest um, bookstore in the world right now, mm. which we know is Amazon. And, and there's so much to, to again, <laughs> make the answer shorter. There's so much you can see, and that's why this model is appealing because when an author is spending, let's say, they spend like a hundred grand a year to send people to Amazon, chances are a small amount, if any, of that audience is coming back to them to where they can communicate with them again. Mm. So we, and, and I think what authors need to think about as they're going forward in the next few years is social media is having more limitation and also engagement is dropping and amazon again we can't control what amazon ads i saw amazon ads launch and i saw i noticed where it's at right now and like can you imagine how much more expensive and and competitive it is you're talking about you could spend and i've done it i spent the first four years of my career just sending traffic and spending a lot of money to to noticing i will still have to do that again yeah. unless I found a way to build effectively and have access to that audience. And that's what authors should be thinking now, because to me is I couldn't do it any longer. Well, the, the horrible thing now with Amazon is you spend money to send ads on say Facebook to send them to Amazon and they land on it, the, your sales page and half your sales page is other people running ads trying to steal the guy you just sent there. Right. Like it's it's we're eating our own young here. So the question I have for you, do you have any feel for the lifetime value of your customers and like the average purchase yes. amounts now? Yes. And in writing this book, I had to pick up all these data. Um, and again, I'm not trying to promote this book. Um, That's um, fine. The shameless promotion is OK just, here. Yeah, it's so much data it for to learn my business and sit down and say, what have I done and how do I need to explain the process to someone who's looking to do it? We noticed like the lifetime value is 89 bucks, which is the average amount for them to get um, all my books. And in terms of sales. So let me just um, stop you there that, for a second. Let me just so people put this into context. So the lifetime value of your customer is 89 bucks. How many books, mm -hmm. do, how many titles do you have in your name? That is, I have 10 titles. 10. And and I sell them usually the price between fourteen ninety nine. I mean around fourteen ninety nine. But because we factor in all the discounts, we're probably gonna give them in between. It's it's about eighty nine. And if yeah. you buy the the full set itself like that, it's eighty nine. And it and the way we have it set up within our emails, which is also free marketing because you've already acquired those people, is that we have flow set up. So once you buy, let's say her and you do not get the, the, the second volume, now you're getting your, your confirmation emails come in, thank you emails, but then you're getting other emails, post-purchase emails about mm. the other books. And that's why we're able to, to sell different books. And even when we have book launch, I never really have a huge announcement on social media or, or all I do is like, hey, new book, poop, <laughs> and we sent out an email to, you know, 300,000 people and it, it makes a difference. But the lifetime value is 89. And I think my assistant mentioned, I think close to 2,000 people that have been through, or have already reached that point. And um, not saying anyone close it, we're talking about reaching past that point. In terms of you know, the AOV, the average order value, we've gotten that from starting up to like, 
15 bucks and now it's at 30 on average meaning like when they come instead of buying one book and paying for shipping now they're buying more stuff yeah we've had people spend upwards 600 700 on the website simply because we were we just have more available and and on top of that we get to track those type of customers and and offer you know different things to them and thank them differently yeah and so that's the other thing like I know you've always been, you actually started with merchandise first. So like, how has that changed over time? Like what products now do you offer and what do you see your audience most interested in after book? They are most interested in journals, which makes sense because it's the poetry. They're, they're just grabbing the journals and so forth. But we do sell a lot of t-shirts and mugs. The one thing we do, because at Shopify, we use a print-on-demand company. So this is where we're hands-off. It goes through our Shopify, but we're hands-off. So once they make the purchase, it feeds the print-on-demand print on company, and they print out different shirts, different different mugs. But, but we've tested out different things, too. I started a membership a while back. I just didn't have the time. We had like we started with like 30 members at like 29 bucks a month. Then I cut that because I couldn't commit to it. I'm too busy. So now we have a text group that, we're, you know, text community that we have. And in there, we noticed that people, some people wanted me to send out a text every day because it's always inspirational messages. What we ended up doing is having a small subscription for it. Right now is for a dollar a month you just get text daily and some of them are wallpapers and um, we started that late we were like five six thousand members in before we started it and if anything that i hope it's not i hope I anyone who's listening to this probably always looking to improve their marketing but one of the things i'm not too fond of is giving freebies and lead magnets because mm -hmm. it's just you fill your mess your your emails with just people who aren't necessarily buyers especially now you have Absolutely. a system to fill them up with buyers why why waste that money and pay the expense to main, maintain them what we notice is out of the 5,000 people i think we have almost 400 people who subscribe to that we notice a lot of the people even just because it was free in the beginning they would not switch over to pay but we notice the people who are coming in and we're letting them know that like we have and we're not we're still keeping them come we keep them coming in not necessarily for free we just tell them they could join it but in the beginning the first message it tells them hey there's this available you get certain amount of messages if you're you're just signing up but if you're a premium member for a dollar a month this is what happens and we're noticing people some people never even receive a text and they're like click and sign up for the dollar versus the ones before they just won't convert over because they're mm. like at this point we're just gonna get it whenever but it's gone right now i don't promote it much um my whole goal is keep it at a, a pace where it maintains itself so like i think it costs us 350 bucks a month to maintain 7,500 people in there so now that they're paying for it and for me as long it's growing where they're always paying for it it works because the email the text is more valuable to us than the email because yeah. we, even now we've noticed like send one text hey this book's available <laughs> they flood the website versus the email they get to them they gotta fight everyone else the text yeah. is not no, so it's a good preparation for the holidays for us good good what else C couple things before we go like what else would you like if would you suggest for somebody that's thinking about going into direct sales, like what's a a path for them to do that if they're kind of new? If you're new to this, definitely go into Shopify. Um, go into looking at it. First, I'll, shameless marketing here. Again, yep. I have a whole thing where I'm teaching. My goal is to teach it to people because I've, I've in, in 2019, the good thing I have, a list of authors that we kind of have our own inner circle we don't even notice it we're just like it's the authors who sell a lot and we can go back and forth in conversation and when i switched to this model i took two of them with me and one of them was was a client of mine who i was helping coaching in terms of uh book marketing and all of them is also that i've seen just not that the level that i've seen it because i was the one who built the system and also i'm good at facebook marketing so i they came to a point they all hired me at the, as their Facebook agent. <laughs> I created an ad agency around them where they're all like, we're going to pay you monthly. You're too many things changing. We don't know how to what's happening. 
But so within take t taking them through that system, I realized how many more people wanted and how more how much more beneficial it was. And and it just puts so many authors in a good position. So I started building. We have a book that breaks down the, the entire process, and then it goes into creating different courses that will help them. If obviously you're gonna run into issues, but definitely start with Shopify. The book. I'll probably just get it over to you, Joe, and then if anybody interested, they could contact you. But definitely, when I'm going back to free resources, definitely start with Shopify because I don't think any platform is as strong as Shopify when it comes to e-commerce simply because it integrates with anything. Mm -hmm. It's it's literally an, an iPhone where you have an app store where you could, you could install any app you want within that shop that could do anything you would hire a tech person to do because you go in there. I created a website in like good two hours, not even probably less and had people shop it on there the next, <laughs> the next day. It's, it's easy to create. There's always a different app for it. The post purchase apps there, everything can integrate very well. And not only that, it does extremely well with, with Facebook ads. And also every other platform with Amazon, I mean, not Amazon, I'm sorry, with Pinterest, Snapchat, Google ads, all of those can, can work well. And it gives you access to those different marketplaces where you could also sell through there via, you know, sell on Amazon through there. You could sell on, on Walmart, you could sell on just as many places because most people don't realize when you're ordering different products on Amazon, this cute little Ajiga and you purchase from there, it's sometimes it's coming from one of those stores that is connected to Amazon. Yeah. And then a lot of people into drop shipping and so forth. So start with Shopify and get as much as you can into it. it's the way I break it down is you start with Shopify, get it set up properly. Definitely use Facebook um, ads when it comes to pairing this up because it's a beautiful marriage. Depending obviously with Facebook goes through different phases and how <laughs> their ad platform is doing. But it's a perfect marriage, and the and the other the third party that we notice is we use Clavio in terms of mm -hmm. um, email marketing. Once you connect the two, it would flows perfect because they come from the ad, go into your um, Shopify, go through the whole funnel in the Shopify, and then go into um, the funnel in your email marketing. And Clavio have done that exceptionally well with e-commerce. It's like it's the number one e-commerce email platform. But definitely, you welcome to ask me any question i have a group i have the acts available that and i can't even to be honest <laughs> i'm trying to search in my brain where else i could tell people to go but it's really difficult because not too many people have this approach yeah and so it's hard so i'm always gonna say come to me not because <laughs> i want all the attention but <laughs> yes and anybody that this will be before 20 books that sees this at 20 books you'll be on my direct sales panel with Katie Cross. So there's two people there that are, you, I don't want to get into numbers, but you guys are selling in excess of mid six figures on direct sales platforms, which a lot of authors are like, how could that be? But it, there are people that are out there that are doing it. And the two of you will be there as you can ask questions and really kind of talk about there's trade-offs, right? There's, it's not all as easy as, but now you're everything. You're, you have to do all the stuff Amazon does, right? Like you do yeah. have to build those, uh, you have to write those sequences and you have to have all the experience for your customers and you have to deal with returns. And yeah. And that, and this is one of the, again, it's, it's going into this entire book that I'm creating. I've realized just the things that when you look at the list of things that people have to do, I'm just glad the next person who gets this is not going to go through everything I have to. I think we spent upwards 20 grand changing our website just to come back to say, the way it was works converted the best. <laughs> so let's not touch it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes that like, experimentation sucks. <laughs> oh my God, man. And it was like same thing with emails. I, being a busy person, we've hired different people to do the emails and we're like, oh, now I do better. Me sending a hi, this is a few words of inspiration, sell more than a lot of the emails that the email agencies were doing. So a lot of it is, is in simplicity and, and just different things that you can, can do. It's like the upsell, we use one upsell. In the book, I, I recommend that. We use one upsell app. We never thought it would convert. It just is not in 
pretty enough, enticing enough, and the conversion rate 60%, no, 50%, no, upward that, between 45 and 50. So um, kind of what I'm trying to do in me getting on that space is telling people like, hey, look, you can skip all these steps because the experimentation phase is expensive. And, and, and even in terms of the figures that you mentioned, one of the thing with this model is that it also gives you cash flow to operate as a business. So therefore, you're able to scale because it's not spending 100 a day and wait 60 days to collect the 150 it makes. It's more like you spend 100 a day and 80 come directly to you and the rest goes to Amazon. But then you have that 80 to reinvest the next day. Yes. I think that that part is really lost on authors fundamentally how that changes a business when you go from, hey, Facebook charges me every time my credit card hits 750 bucks, which could be every day, <laughs> to <laughs> now I sold those books, I got to wait 60 days for that cash to come in. You have this this huge gap in, in cash flow. And when you can shrink that down to days, literally two or three working days, how that you can cycle so oh, much yeah. faster. And even... And this is, again, way out there. The, so many things we learn from this. It's a lot. Even with Facebook. Facebook has thresholds for everyone. So one of the things we notice as growing with Facebook, we came from having a threshold where our credit card getting hit daily to where we were on a $10,000 a month. So we got a huge credit line to where we pay an invoice where it, it rotated around 60 days, to be honest. So... Part of this, and the one thing I learned about this model is not only, it's not only for the sake of making more profit, because sometimes it may not be profitable, you may have some, some up and down, or not necessarily profitable overall, but sometimes it's for someone like me who's always reinvesting, because I'm thinking long term, and even like a month where I said I could have decreased my ad spend, but I kept it, because I wanted more people to come to my pipeline, so now I'm like, I have a well pumped email list um, because every day we market ads aren't getting cheaper. <laughs> They're mm. getting more expensive as the day goes on. But we notice just a lot of the things that relationship we build and and just partnership because Facebook I've never dealt with a I haven't dealt with a Facebook rep for three years, but I've had a Facebook account manager and I've spoken to people on a higher level up simply because of volume and consistency or mm. just Engram. I had I have obviously upper tier relationship there where it's and my assistant always <laughs> she always make these jokes like, Yeah, I don't know how to get a hold of anyone on Amazon, Engram and Facebook, but Alex can give you a phone number. <laughs> and <laughs> And that's what was spending a lot to where it's like, hey, I text like, hey, it's like, what's going on with Facebook? And my ad, you know, ad account manager would be like, yeah, this, this, and that. So that's the benefit of it too, because long term, you you get to see how all this interact and you get to put yourself in a good position. And mm -hmm. the legwork, it comes with it, but there's a way to outsource it. So right now we have somebody, even one of our customer service reps is in the Philippines, who's just plug into the system. Speak to people. There's a app we use called Gorgeous. And someone commented on Facebook or email, wherever she still can answer them in one place. Nice. So then there's that, and you can. There's always way to outsource. It's like my first buddy. He was not like me. He's like, I'm not doing a warehouse. Can this guy do it? And and he has fulfillment. He never touches anything. To him, it still operates like Amazon, except he get crap load of data and the expense sometimes is him just having to pay for the inventory and some material ahead of time mm -hmm. but it's if you want to do it there's ways to make it easier on you yes cool cool pierre it's been awesome having you on here it's been a pleasure right. i love it i'm sorry for talking so much it's no. like, like i'm in the space of sharing this and it's been like on my heart i told you i spent the last two months prepping this book and i'm like people need to know about this it's it's i'm looking at the people i've helped do this and they're like they're living their best life unlike me obviously i took a much more risk but it's beautiful so thank you for giving me the opportunity to even do no this is great and sometimes i know you feel like you're out in the wilderness yelling and nobody can hear the message mm -hmm. uh, i i've been talking to authors that this is where this is all going it's like the closer you can get to your customer the better it is. There's, there's no, there's no, no way 
that that can go bad unless you treat your customers badly. But the, anybody that's in between you and your customer can create friction and and you you're going to lose out. So I I, lo- I love to that that you could come on here and talk and and there's some success stories. I know a lot of people have tried this and it maybe not have worked out as well as it has for you, but I think that as authors kind of start making the connection for those that want to do this, right? Maybe it's not for everybody, right? Just there's there's a multitude of publishing mm-hmm. models for th- for those of us that really want to create an experience that's 100% our control like you have to do direct sales yeah and if i may add this to and i know we're closing but for any author who's who's sometimes they might be afraid that they may lose in the other models that was one of the things that not what I was concerned about, but the, the people that I, some of my inner circle that we introduced this to in the beginning, they were concerned about their Amazon rankings and the sales there or bookstores and things of that nature. And what we've seen with this model, simply because of the fact that you have data to make decision, you have Facebook hunt out to find the sales. And in that process, you, you're not, because the way, the way ads work is that they have different objectives. So when you run a Facebook ads, a lot of authors are running for link clicks. They think everyone is seeing the ad, but no, Facebook is sending the ad to the group of people who are often clicking. So you're not in the same pool as the, the engagers. That's why the objectives are all in different categories. So what Facebook does is the people who, who are the buyers, they're more likely to do, see the ad. However, in that group, there's some people who engage in clicks, and but Facebook doesn't necessarily pay attention to them because it's going after the buyers. So what happens is we see we, within that system, as while we're getting the benefits of collecting the data and selling direct, we're also still reaping the old benefits where we're getting a bunch of link clicks and people still like, we're gonna go to Amazon, or we're getting the engagement where I've grown like 100,000 followers without even trying to on, on Instagram and Facebook more. And even in the process, one of the story I tell a lot is like, I hit the USA Today bestseller list in May. And we're like, how? 30,000 copies of our <laughs> books wasn't even registered to any platform. They can't see what we're doing in our Shopify, but we realize the access that comes from just doing this, it, it pushes us in all the places. So mm-hmm. that's why I like, I don't necessarily look for, do for anything for followers, do anything for link clicks, do anything for my ranking. We hit Amazon top 100, not even having, Amazon covers 30% of our sales. So that's how to think about it that like, even though the model is not necessarily for everyone, but it taps into all spaces. Because even now I'm entertaining giving my next book to a publisher simply because I don't want to handle enough of mine. Because it's more of like, I have 10 books and the inventory and so forth. We all, and that's what we're opening our warehouse to doing fulfillment for other people. But it's just for me, I'm like, now I want my next book to be handled by someone else. We can't, we're just going to keep maintaining this. But it's, it gave you the leverage. It's giving mm-hmm. me the leverage there. It's given me, it's so much because in the first traditional publishing deal I had, the book is doing extremely well. It has 5,000 reviews and sold 40,000 or 50,000 copies. I'm not doing anything for it. It's just the excess keeps spilling over into everything. People are just going to buy and the publisher's like, oh, great marketing plan, Pierre. And I'm like, yeah, I only market two books. <laughs> None of them <laughs> is on your catalog. So that's so that's something to think about. Uh, in this, as long as you have the consistency, you're able to scale, the constant flow, you're able to scale. It puts you in a position that you, you don't realize you will be. You don't lose a step. You just add an extra one. Hmm. Awesome. Thanks a lot for sharing all this with everybody. And I will be seeing you in a couple weeks. Yes. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right, man. Good talking to you. All right, Joe. It was a pleasure. Yep. All right. All right. And Bye. we are off the air. <laughs>